Great. Well, good morning, seniors. Uh, I'm very happy to be back in your schools and to be with you and your teachers who are present this morning. Um, as you know, we, we had to skip last Wednesday because I guess all of our schools had at least a two-hour delay, so we canceled the show. But this week we're back and we're going to continue with the uh, three remaining topics. And our topic this week is Christianity and Islam. Uh, is there a connection, the connection between the Christian faith and the Islamic or Muslim faith? Um, I, I'd like to speak uh, on today's topic in two parts. First of all, uh, last week we talked about how uh, the church founded by Christ subsists, that's the word of the Second Vatican Council, it, it exists fully uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. But I wanted to uh, show you uh, the relationship then of the church to all of humanity. And we'll take a look at that and I have a graphic to show you for that. And then second, the second part of our presentation this morning will be on this connection, uh, a little uh, overview of the Islamic faith and, and then uh, some of the similarities and the differences. Uh, between Christianity and Islam. Uh, I would like to invite, and I don't know, there, there might be some um, uh, students, or maybe some seniors in our school, of the uh, Islamic faith. I, I don't know that. Uh, but if there are, I, I welcome you to contribute uh, during this. Uh, I welcome you to make any comments or even corrections. I'm not an Islamic scholar. I, I, I have participated in some dialogues at the University of Kentucky when I was in Lexington on Islam and Catholicism, so I've had a chance to do a little bit of study, but if there is someone whose faith is, um, uh, is Islamic faith, uh, feel free to uh, make a comment. I, I would welcome that this morning, all right? So before we begin on our topics, I would like to, uh, of course, begin with a prayer. And I've chosen a, a, a prayer from the F Liturgy of Good Friday. Um, it's a very different liturgy if you've ever attended it, and I hope you would try maybe uh, this Good Friday to go to your uh, parish and attend the solemn liturgy of the Lord's Passion. A, a part of it before the um, uh, adoration of the cross is an ancient form of the prayer of the faithful. You know that in most masses we have the prayer of the faithful, but on Good Friday it takes a very ancient form. It goes way back to the earlier centuries of the church and it sounds very different from our prayer of the faithful today. But there are 10 petitions. I'm going to use uh, three of them. Uh, the one for the Jewish people, uh, the one for uh, non-Christians, and then the one for people who don't believe in God at all. And if you listen to these prayers carefully that we pray, the Universal Catholic Church prays on Good Friday, you get an idea of this relationship and our, our prayer, our hope for our brothers and sisters who A, don't believe in Christ or don't believe in God at all. So um, listen to these prayers. There's a, a thing I quote an awful lot, and that is that the rule of our praying is the rule of our believing in the church. It's an ancient norm. What we pray is what we believe. And, and so listen to these prayers from the Good Friday Liturgy, and you'll get a good idea of our regard toward the uh, other non-Christian faiths. So listen, let's, let's begin now with prayer. These are the prayers, three of, the, three of those ten petitions from the Good Friday Liturgy. Let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord for those who do not believe in Christ. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world through Christ our Lord. For those who do not believe in God, let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty ever-living God who created all people to seek you always by desiring you 
and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Those are beautiful prayers, as I said, from the solemn liturgy of Good Friday, but if you listen to those words, you, you can see that we raise up to God those who are not with us through baptism, who do not believe in Christ, beginning with a special prayer for the Jewish people, uh, the people of the first covenant, and then all other non-Christians, and then finally those who don't believe that there's a God at all. And also those prayers were very clear in saying, if those folks are going to come to accept Christ, or at least accept God, um, it's going to be by our example, uh, by the love and the service that they see in those who do believe uh, that they might come to a fullness of faith. So the prayers are really uh, uh, lifting up those who don't believe, but they're asking too that we can become better witnesses uh, and live our faith more fully so that we'll attract and draw others uh, to Christ and to the church. So, so last week we said that uh, the church that Christ founded and his intention, what he intended the church to be in its fullness subsists or exists fully in the Catholic Church. And if we could, uh, I'd like to just uh, draw your attention to this graphic that someone had made for me um, and uh, I hope you'll find it helpful because uh, it, I mentioned last week that if you, uh, we had a wonderful question from one of the seniors about uh, the relationship of the church to us. And I said, well, if you picture concentric circles, uh, that's a good way to uh, image the theology of the Second Vatican Council regarding the relationship of our Catholic Church really to all of humanity. So if we could just take a look at this uh, visual, uh, I hope you can see it uh, well enough. Here in the center, we have Christ and the Catholic Church. Um, uh, they are one reality. Just on Sunday, I had a chance to speak to people who are choosing to come into the church at our cathedral, um, and I quoted uh, a transcript, a quotation from the transcript of the trial of St. Joan of Arc. You know, in the 14th century, she was put on trial and ultimately she was executed, but she was asked by the inquisitors um, uh, in her trial, uh, what's the relationship between Christ and the church? And she said, well, uh, this is what I know. They're one and the same. Christ and his church are one and the same. Let's not complicate the matter. That's what she said to uh, the people who were asking her when she was on trial. So here we have the, the church, the Catholic church, in, in the fullness of what we believe Christ intended his church to have, uh, the fullness of the apostolic faith, the fullness of means of sanctification and all of our seven sacraments, and the unity with the vicar of Christ on earth, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. Um, you might call those, and, and the catechism speaks of, the four C's. I, I use the word four C's, but they're, they're creed. We believe the one apostolic faith. The code, we have uh, one law, one discipline that unites us uh, the uh, uh, cult, or C-U-L-T, properly understood, which means worship. So we have the sacraments and our liturgy. And finally, communion. We are one with the universal pastor of the church, which is the Bishop of Rome. So there's the very center of this, this circle, the, the Catholic Church. We begin to move out in others who are more or less closely related to the Catholic Church. And the very first circle next to ours are the Orthodox churches. They have the fullness of our creed, the fullness of the cult, the worship and the liturgy. They have the, uh, their own spiritual disciplines and uh, uh, practices, but what they lack is the communion. They're, they're not in communion with the Bishop of Rome, with the universal pastor of the church. So, so they have separated themselves from communion, but they have all of the means of sanctification, God's holy word, the tradition, sacred tradition. So they're on the next, uh, next circle, the closest to, to us. And we call them, actually, uh, the popes have used the term, our sister churches. There are many different orthodox churches in the world, different forms of orthodoxy. Um, 
In fact, I'm meeting with an Orthodox bishop uh, next week, I think it is, uh, who's coming to town and, and we're going to get together. So, so our churches are very close. They're called sister churches. As we move out, next line are all of the other Christian denominations. Uh, we are one with them in Christ through baptism. They have the word of God. Uh, they worship, although they don't have the seven sacraments. So they lack the sacraments. Uh, they, they believe in baptism and Eucharist generally. Uh, but baptism is essential. It's through baptism that we come to uh, Christ and become members of his mystic body. So they are related to the Catholic Church through baptism and their faith in Christ. Uh, they're not one with us in um, uh, communion, uh, and that's why we call if someone who is a baptized uh, non-Catholic, let's say a Lutheran or a Methodist, an Episcopalian, a Baptist, but if they want to come into the Catholic Church, we call that coming into full communion. Right, they're already in relationship with us in the church, but they lack full communion. And so there's the process of coming into uh, the fullness of our Catholic faith. And um, um, the next level out, I have that word catechumens. Uh, during the Lenten season, we have people who are not baptized, but who are w wishing to become part of us one with us in the communion of the Catholic Church, and they're preparing for the three sacraments of initiation. Most of you have, um, or perhaps all of you, have received all of those, baptism, confirmation, and holy communion. So pr pretty much at the Easter vigil, these people who are desiring to come to the church will receive all of the initiation sacraments uh, at Holy Saturday in that solemn liturgy. They have a very special relationship to us because they desire it. They have, they have the grace of desire and uh, soon will be one with us in full communion in the church. Moving out in the next level is Judaism or the Jewish people. And it's important for us to remember because there's been this strain, this sometimes terrible uh, regard regarding the Jewish people uh, uh, from the, the standpoint of Christians. Um, we believe that God does not revoke his covenant. He remembers his covenant, he says in, in Deuteronomy, to the thousandth generation. So Jesus himself told us that he didn't come to do away with the law and the prophets. He came to complete or fulfill what began in the first covenant. And so the Jewish people have a very special relationship to us. They are not baptized. Uh, they do not believe in Christ. But we share with them a good bit of our, all of their scriptures. And a good bit of our scripture is the, what we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures. I'd like to read a passage from uh, a wonderful uh, document from uh, Pope Francis uh, called The Joy of the Gospel. Uh, he wrote it in um, November of uh, 2013 and uh, on the Feast of Christ the King. And in that document, The Joy of the Gospel, he addresses the relationship of our Catholic Church to the Jewish people. Here's, here's what Pope Francis wrote. We hold the Jewish people in special regard because their covenant with God has never been revoked for the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Here he quotes uh, St. Paul uh, in his letter to the Romans, chapter 11. The call and the gift of God is, are irrevocable. The church which shares with the Jews an important part of the sacred scriptures, our Old Testament, looks upon the people of the covenant and their faith as one of the sacred roots of our own Christian identity. As Christians, we cannot consider Judaism as a foreign religion, nor do we include the Jews among those called to turn from idols to serve the true God. With them, we believe in the one God who acts in history, and with them, we accept his revealed word. Those are very, uh, very clear words that Pope Francis wrote in his uh, document, The Joy of the Gospel, about the Jewish people. Next, moving out from the Jewish people, we have um, the Islamic faith. And they're always mentioned in the Second Vatican Council. There is a particular reference to uh, uh, Islam. And also in the same document, Pope Francis uh, uh, speaks of them. And I want to read what he says about Islam. And we're going to consider that more fully in the second part of today's presentation. But here's, here is what uh, Pope Francis wrote about uh, the um, uh, Muslims. Our relationship with the followers of Islam has taken on great importance since they are now significantly present in many traditionally Christian countries where they can freely worship and become fully a part of society. We must never forget that they 
profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us they adore the one merciful God who will judge humanity at the last day. The sacred writings of Islam have retained some Christian teachings. Jesus and Mary receive profound veneration, and it is admirable to see how Muslims, both young and old, men and women, make time for daily prayer and faithfully take part in religious services. Many of them also have a deep conviction that their life in its entirety is from God and for God. They also acknowledge the need to respond to God with an ethical commitment and with mercy toward those who are most in need. Those are some of the words that Pope Francis addressed to those of the Islamic faith in this document, The Joy of the Gospel. As we move out, we have the other non-Christian religions of the world. Here you would have Hindu, uh, the, the Hindu religion, the uh, uh, Buddhists, and, and all of the others who believe in a god or gods, um, uh, but are not um, uh, of, of these other levels of Islam or Judaism and certainly not believing in Christ. But they are related to um, uh, us uh, in a, a less, lesser degree, but still in relationship to the Catholic Church. And finally, you have in the outermost level that part of humanity who denies the existence of a god, who do not believe at all that there are, is a god or any gods. Right? Um, but still, uh, what, what the position of our church is with regard, especially to from the other non-Christians down to the center here, is that we uh, do not reject anything um, of those religions which is good or true. Yeah. And as I said, I think last week, uh, two weeks ago, uh, in, in most of these religions you'll have the command to love others, uh, to do good, to serve people in need. Th those are qualities of a moral goodness. Uh, there are uh, understandings of the truth of a, a God who is good, who, who makes uh, things, who, who assists us. There, there, there are all of those uh, dispositions of those non-Christian religions, and we do not reject them. Uh, we say that there, there is goodness and truth in those religions. And the Council uses a, a very interesting phrase, that it is a predisposition to the Gospel. In other words, the tenets of these non-Christian religions, the, the truths that they would believe, uh, predispose, they, they dispose a person to, if they are open to hear the gospel and see Christians living the gospel, to accept the fullness of what they believe, which is in Christ Jesus. Uh, and, and so the goodness and the truth of those other non-Christian religions should dispose those people to accept Christ. And, and last time we were together, I mentioned that um, my conviction is that, of course, Jesus is the only way of salvation. We know that. We're, humanity is saved solely through the death and resurrection of Christ. And what I had shared with you last week is that when those folks who do not believe in Christ uh, open their eyes on the other side when they pass through death, they will stand before the one and only Savior, Jesus. And those who were sincere, who lived their faith or lived their lives uh, according to a good conscience uh, and uh, were willing to serve others and did not live a selfish, self-centered lifestyle, they will see in Christ the fullness of everything that they held to be holy and good. And they'll be able to embrace Christ and through Christ come to uh, ultimate salvation and eternal life of happiness in heaven. So I hope that was a help, but that's, that's the, the, the way our church in the documents of the Second Vatican Council and in the teachings following the council up into the document from our Holy Father, Pope Francis, envisions the relationship of all humanity uh, to us who are in Christ in the Catholic Church. So that's pretty much what I, what I wanted to say uh, about uh, the, um, uh, that, that relationship that whatever is good and true we see as a preparation to accept the gospel and the church does not condemn or reject anything that is good or true in those other religions. Now, let's, let's turn to uh, consider uh, some, some notions about the Islamic faith. We heard the, the things that Saint, uh, Pope Francis uh, said uh, about uh, the Muslim people. He pointed out particularly uh, their devotion to prayer uh, their devotion to worship, 
uh, their devotion to help people who uh, are in need. Th those are all uh, important aspects of the Islamic faith. So let's look a little bit at the background, because as you know, you can't watch the news at any time of the day without seeing something about this, um, these groups of um, uh, radical, uh, they, call, they use the word jihadist, and we'll look at that word, but these, these radical uh, Muslim groups who are perpetrating heinous crimes and um, terrible uh, suffering on people and executing uh, seemingly um, uh, at, at, at whim uh, large numbers of people, particularly Christians. So I think it's important that we take an honest look at, at that and try to understand a little bit of the background and what's going on at present. So of course, Islam looks to Muhammad as its founder. Muhammad was born um, probably in what's now Saudi Arabia around the year 570, and he died in the year 632. So his, primarily he, he lived at the end of the 6th century and to the, almost the middle of the 7th century. Um, and he's considered in Islam as God's last messenger. God's last messenger. The, the most complete uh, message that God wants to bring to humanity came through um, uh, Muhammad. Islam respects what was revealed to Moses. Um, and Islam respects the revelation, the teaching that Jesus gave. But here's the difference. They say that Muhammad is the last messenger of God because Islam believes that the Jewish people in writing down or in understanding Moses twisted the real message of Moses and the other prophets. And they believe that the disciples of Jesus twisted or changed the message that Jesus preached. So that what we have in the Gospels isn't really what Jesus taught. Uh, and here's the reason they say that. They have a different, a very different understanding of inspiration, okay? Um, in the Hebrew Scriptures and in the New Testament, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we believe that the Holy Spirit inspires those sacred authors. Let's take a Moses or a Jeremiah or an Isaiah or a Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit inspires the author to write down what God wants us to know without error, but using his human capacities, okay? using images that might come to the author's mind. Uh, if the author writes very good Greek, you can see that. If he doesn't write good Hebrew or Greek, you can recognize that uh, in the writing. So there is a marriage in Jewish and Christian understanding of revelation between the human and the divine. Okay? There's a mystery of God influencing the author, but the author still being present in what is actually written down. It is God's word, it is without error, but it also has a human contribution to it. Um, this is very much incarnational, isn't it? The, 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 the synergy, the working together of the human and the divine. Our very notion of inspiration or revelation, the written revelation, uh, is, is in, in the model of the incarnation, Jesus being true God and true man. So that the, the communion, the unity of humanity and divinity, and that works itself out in our understanding of inspiration. We don't believe that when St. Matthew sat down to write his gospel, the Holy Spirit whispered in his ear exactly what he was to write down. No. It is God's word, it is without error, it is the truth, but Matthew played a part in telling the stories that he wanted to emphasize to the community for which he was writing. So there is that human element in the composition of both the Hebrew scriptures and in the Jewish scriptures. This is where the Islamic faith says the problem happened and it needed to be fixed because that human element twisted the word that God wanted the people to have. And that's why the holy book in Islam is called the Quran and that's an Arabic word for dictation. The very word Quran means dictation. And so, whereas in the Jewish and Christian understanding, you have the humanity and divinity working together, the author and God's inspiration. In the Quran, you have the angel Gabriel, the archangel Gabriel, dictating to Muhammad what needs to be written in the Quran. 
There's no, he is just like a conduit. He's like a hose or a, an extension cord with the electricity going through it. He makes no contribution. He's simply dictating, or if he's writing it or someone else, a scribe is writing, he is dictating what he's being told to say. So the Quran has 114 chapters. They're called surahs, or shuras, um, and it was written in a very brief period of time. In, in about 23 years, the Quran, according to the Islamic tradition, was written down. That's very different because we believe it took, the, the Old Testament uh, comprises about a 1200 year period, about 1200 years from the earliest part of the Old Testament until the latest part, the wisdom writings of the Old Testament, and the New Testament about 40 years or so, let's say from the year 60 to the year 100, uh, so a 40 year period. But the Quran was written in about a relatively short period of time. Um, Muhammad began to get these uh, uh, signs of God's revelation. Some of them were auditory. Most of them were auditory. Sometimes there was a vision, but most were just words, auditory. Uh, around the year 610, when he was about 40 years old, he began to experience these um, uh, revelations. Now, the word Islam itself, that's the holy book, the dictation, the Quran. Islam, the word in Arabic, means surrender or submission. And, and the idea is a good one. We, we believe that Jesus taught us to pray that God's will be done. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so in Islam, the idea is one surrenders one's life to this revelation and to the will of God. Uh, you submit to, to that. And there are five pillars uh, in the Islamic faith. Um, there's, first of all, the declaration of faith, which they make several times a day. Uh, th there is only one God, Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. That's the declaration of faith. There is one God and Muhammad is his prophet. Um, the second pillar of Islam is prayer. And as Pope Francis mentioned in, in his Joy of the Gospel, we should, we, we should really uh, be um, inspired by the way uh, Muslims devote themselves to prayer. Five times a day when they're in public, and maybe you have seen it too, I've been in airports, um, and uh, the men and women, particularly men, are, are not ashamed to get down on the floor in the waiting area by the, by the, the gate of the airlines and get down and, and do the prayers. And they do them on the plane itself. They, 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 they are very uh, visible and uh, very courageous in taking that prayer time uh, as, as uh, Islam demands of them. So, um, that, so the, the second pillar is, is the prayer uh, uh, pillar. The third is fasting. And we believe, of course, in prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. These, these three elements are, are very important in Islam. Uh, the element of fasting is, is, uh, can be done at any time, but in particular, there's one month. It's called Ramadan, and there's an entire fast. That entire month, uh, they, they go on a very strict fast uh, as a penance uh, for one's uh, sins. The fourth pillar is almsgiving. Uh, and that's particularly practiced uh, during the month of Ramadan uh, to uh, seek out uh, good causes to give of your uh, treasure, to, to give of the blessings God has given you uh, to those who are in need. So, and the final, the fifth uh, pilgrimage, so the first was the declaration of faith, there's only one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, and finally, the pilgrimage. It's called the Hajj, H-A-J-J, -J, the Hajj. And uh, if, if you possibly can, uh, every Muslim is supposed to try to make a pilgrimage at least once in one's lifetime to Mecca. Uh, and uh, it, there's a particular, it's the 12th month of their calendar. They follow a lunar calendar. So the, the, the final month of their uh, lunar year um, and there's a five-day period during that time when you are to go and, and make this pilgrimage to the holy place um, in, um, in Mecca. So that's the fifth uh, um, pillar. Um, so those are, those are the components, I guess you might say, of, of the Islamic faith. Now, what I'd like to look at is, is this aspect of Islam that's making the news. Then we save some time for conversation, for questions or observations. Um, in 622, so about 10 years before Muhammad died, uh, he founded the first Islamic state. This is a word we hear a lot today. That word ISIS is the Islamic state of Iraq and Syria. 
So in 622, Muhammad founded the first Islamic state. And according to Islam, the government is to, has only one form, and that's what we call a theocracy. Maybe you've heard of that in, in social studies. But a theocracy is a form of government where there is no separation whatsoever between religion and the government administration. They are one and the same. In other words, the civil laws all have to reflect the religious laws. In the United States, uh, we were founded, our founding fathers wanted to be sure that uh, we had a separation of church and state because we came from European countries where there were, was not that separation. And, and so here we wanted to protect religion. We didn't do away with religion, but we wanted to give religion its rightful, rightful place, not being dominated by the government, nor would the government have to uh, obey any one particular church law. So we have a, a healthy separation uh, of church and state, a freedom of religion. That is never the case in an Islamic state. It is a theocracy where Muslim law, Muslim theology, uh, governs the military, uh, the political, uh, the civil life of all of the people in the Islamic State. That's, that Islamic State founded by Muhammad in 622 actually lasted into the 13th century when it, when it kind of uh, dissolved. Now, I mentioned earlier that Muhammad died in the year 632. And when he died, he was the sole and supreme leader of the faith and the Islamic State. Uh, he had all the power, both of the faith and of the government, it was all invested in him. Politic he was the political leader, the military leader, the spiritual leader. It was all invested in Muhammad. So a crisis happens when he dies. Who takes over? Who's going to succeed Muhammad? And that leads to the two main divisions of Muslims today. You hear it on the news all the time. There are the Shia or the Shiites and the Sunnis. And this is how those two groups came about. When Muhammad died, one group of his followers maintained that Muhammad had explicitly designated his son-in-law, his daughter's husband, Ali, to be his successor. The word in Arabic for successor is caliph, C-A-L-I-P-H, to be the caliph, his son-in-law, Ali. And so they followed um, Ali as the successor, the caliph, to Muhammad. And that's the beginning of the Shia Muslims or the Shiites. The Shia or Shiite Muslims. They are the minority of Muslims. There are only about 10% of the world's Muslims are Shiites. Okay? That was the first group. The second group said Muhammad never designated Ali, his son-in-law, to succeed him to be the caliph. Rather, since he made no such appointment, they gathered the elders of his Muhammad's companions and they chose someone to be the caliph or the successor to Muhammad. And from the group of senior companions of Muhammad, they chose Muhammad's father-in-law, okay? uh, his, his wife's father, um, to one of his wife's fathers, uh, to, uh, father, to be uh, the caliph, the successor. His name was Abu Bakr, B-A-K-R, Abu Bakr. And uh, he is the beginning of the Sunni Muslims, okay? those who said Muhammad didn't designate anyone to be a successor, to be the caliph. Rather, we can choose someone. They choose his father-in-law. And this is the beginning of the Sunni Muslims, which represent approximately 90% of the world's Muslim. They are the, the two main branches, the Shiites and the Sunnis, and by far the Sunnis are the, 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 the big majority. Now from these Sunnis, from the majority group, you have different fundamentalist groups. Uh, these are the ones we hear of in the news that are perpetrating horrible violence on other fellow Muslims that they don't agree with, and particularly on Christians and Jews. Um, the the, the Sunni, Sunni radical fundamentalists. And uh, the, the big one that we're hearing on every day is ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and uh, Syria. Um, last July, summer of 2014, um, they declared a caliphate. 
they, they declared that Abu al-Baghdadi, Abu al-Baghdadi was the caliph, and they established an Islamic state. And we see the maps on the news of how that Islamic state uh, in Iraq and the areas of Syria are expanding and uh, forming their own military and, 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 and causing millions of people to uh, leave their homes and uh, hundreds upon hundreds, thousands uh, are uh, uh, being executed or dying in battle uh, as, as they continue to take more and more territory for the Islamic State. That was July of 2014 when they declared the Caliph uh, Abu al-Baghdadi. Um, the next month, August of 2014, in Nigeria, there's that group that we hear about almost every day, Boko Haram. And Boko Haram is uh, a, um, a, a form of the uh, Sunni uh, uh, Muslims um, who have their own caliph, Abu Bakr Shakao, Abu Bakr Shakao, uh, and he was declared caliph last August. So that was a second Islamic state. Now something very uh, somewhat frightful happened this past Sunday, just on March the 8th, and that is that the Boko Haram Islamic State pledged allegiance and unity with ISIS, which means that they are working toward one worldwide caliphate. These radical Islamists, or jihadists as they're called, uh, are working now to a unified worldwide Islamic caliphate or Islamic State. This is the terrorist movement that we, we hear about, and they're characterized by violence, abduction. Um, we, we know that 276 schoolgirls that were abducted April of last year, uh, a few weeks ago, 21 Coptic Christians were beheaded uh, in Libya um, uh, by the... Uh, so the point that I want to make is that this is not the true understanding of the Islamic faith. Uh, rather, these are radical elements within Islam using their faith to perpetrate another agenda, an agenda of uh, ruthless violence and government control. And um, we, we certainly have to be uh, quite um, uh, concerned about this. The Vatican constantly is trying to negotiate and uh, some military force is being used to try to contain this, but uh, we, we, we have um, just um, a, a very difficult worldwide situation, especially since this Sunday when the two major terrorist groups have now uh, pledged to be in a unity. The fact is that ISIS has not accepted that offer of a, to, to my knowledge, but that was just made by Boko Haram this past Sunday. Now, I'd like to conclude just by a little reflection on this word jihad, and then maybe there'll be some questions. But the jihad, jihadists, um, is, is usually uh, translated in the media by the word holy war. A jihad is a holy war. Well, in truth, the uh, Arabic word jihad means a struggle. Uh, or to strive, to, to struggle, to strive. And the primary meaning of jihad is an internal struggle. Um, it's the battle with self. And we all know that. That's, we call that conversion, confession. We, we, we strive to follow Christ's uh, law of love and God, loving neighbor. Uh, we strive to do away with sin in our lives. So the real meaning of jihad is this personal internal struggle for conversion to the pillars of Islam and to live faithfully as a, a follower of Muhammad. But there is that secondary meaning of jihad, and that is the notion of holy war, uh, the use of military force to defeat infidels. And of course, infidels are those who do not accept the Islamic faith. Uh, and to spread the Islamic state uh, to be a worldwide reality so that the world would be under a theocracy where there'd be no separation of government and religion and the religion would be that of Islam. Um, if jihad is declared, and it has been, uh, then the goal is supreme, right? To, to defeat the infidel and spread Islam, the goal is supreme and there are no moral limits on the means to achieve the supreme goal. So that moral, that morality 
that drives a jihad is very foreign to our idea where you can't use immoral means to achieve your end. But in a jihad, any means, beheadings, mass executions, displacement of large parts of people, innocent people, women and children who are non-combatants, there's no moral assessment of that because the end to spread the Islamic State is supreme. And so you don't morally analyze what's going on because you're trying to achieve the supreme end of spreading the Islamic faith. It's so very, very different. Now let me just close with this reflection of the uniqueness of our Christian faith, and particularly our Catholic faith, the gospel and violence. You know, Lent is a journey, and we began with the prayers on Good Friday. Lent takes us on a journey of 40 days to the solemn three days of the Triduum, uh, where we celebrate the suffering of Christ, his death on the cross, and then his entombment, and then his glorious resurrection on Easter Sunday. What is the uniqueness of that message of the Paschal Mystery? Jesus became the victim of violence. Right? He didn't ask us to use violence to spread the gospel, but rather he entered into the most intense and unjust form of suffering and cruelty and then was crucified in the excruciating pain of that, and he transforms that violence and injustice which victimized him. He transforms it into victory. He became a victim in order to be a victor. And that's the message, that's the good news that we celebrate. We don't spread the love of Christ or the gospel of Christ or the Catholic Church by means of violence, uh, by, by means of force. Uh, rather, Jesus took all of that to himself and changed it. He transformed it to become the means of our salvation. I think it's a good thing for us to keep in our minds and hearts as we continue this Lenten journey toward the great three days of the Paschal Triduum. So having shared those thoughts, uh, I'd be happy uh, to try to respond to any comments you have or any questions. Do we have anybody uh, would like to uh, make a statement or a comment? You're Catholic? Wonderful. Welcome. Hi, good morning. Hi. Good morning. Hi. Um, does the church condemn the actions of ISIS in regards to recent news where they destroyed the ancient museum artifacts in Iraq? Uh -huh. And how does it relate to the destruction and theft associated with the Crusades? Well, my heart was broken. I saw some of the news footage of the smashing of those thousands of year old treasures of those ancient civilizations. Uh, but, but you see, that, that again, we're dealing with these radical Islamists and uh, they want to eliminate any culture that is not that of Islam. And, and so these, these international world treasures, I mean, those, those sorts of things belong to the world. They were preserved in that museum and there they are reduced to sh shreds. I mean, they're, they're just smashed. Uh, the church, Pope Francis has been very vocal in condemning. In fact, I, had an, I have an article uh, uh, where he called on all Muslim leaders uh, to uh, condemn the uh, violence, the atrocities perpetrated by ISIS and Boko Haram. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the Pope and the U.S. bishops with our government, uh, urging our government to take a stronger, uh, uh, more vocal uh, opposition to a call for a united world to oppose the atrocities that are being perpetrated by ISIS and Boko Haram. So yet the church has condemned, but the Pope and bishops condemn that senseless killing, uh, the, you know, the lack of respect for human dignity and human life. We, we've got to speak out against that. It's absolutely senseless and it, it's, it's horrible. Yes, but um we didn't we pretty much do the same thing during the Crusades? I mean, I see some similarities there. Are you talking about the Crusades? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, the, yeah, the Crusades were eight expeditions, you might say, from Europe to the Holy Land, but 
I, I think we have to remember why the Crusades were necessary. Why, why did we have the, Why did the uh, armies from, from different Christian uh, kingdoms, uh, with the urging of the Pope, um, uh, go to the Holy Land? Why, why did they go there? Well, also you gotta you have to think about where they're coming from too, though. Like I don't understand. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the point is that the Christian armies went to the Holy Land to take back the Christian sites, which from the first and second century were Christian sites of, of, of Christ and sites of the Old Testament as well, which were taken over and destroyed in the seventh and eighth centuries uh, by the uh, Muslims. Um, and, and so the Christian armies of Europe went down there to try to regain what were Christian possessions, lands, and particularly the, the holy places in the Holy Land. Now, there is no question that there were excesses, uh, and especially, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the armies got out of control in, at various times and places, and there was a ruthless killing of people as well. Uh, that has to be judged, I think, in the, the standards of the 11th and 12th, 13th centuries during, during the time of the, the, the various uh, crusades. And it, it has to be seen in, in the context of those times, which were much more barbaric than the 21st century. The problem here is that society and our understanding of morality has, has moved on a, 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 a thousand years uh, almost since that time. And what we're seeing is the same barbarism of the 11th century uh, now in the 21st century. Uh, we, we have developed and moved beyond that. Uh, but these folks, who are these radical terrorists, are uh, continuing to perpetrate those same sorts of barbaric uh, punishments on other people simply because of their faith. Yeah, is that all right? Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Do we have someone else? Please don't be afraid. Um, hi, hi there, good morning. What's your name? Christopher Christopher, welcome. Um my question, Bishop, is um, in the Hadith or stories about Muhammad, um, there's a point where Muhammad is directly asked to um, recite the name of God by Gabriel. I, now, I know that Gabriel doesn't have like a similar or exactly the same position within the Christian church because we believe that um, our writings are inspired rather than directly dictated. But does Gabriel play a role in um, divine revelation in the Catholic faith as well, albeit um, working with the writers? Sure. sure. Uh, well, I mean, uh, Gabriel, uh, of course, is the, uh, the, the, the very word angelos is uh, a messenger. So the, the word angel really refers to their function more than their being. Um, and the angels in scripture carry God's message, carry God's word to humans. And you see that in the Old Testament. And of course, Gabriel is the one who appears to Zechariah in the temple and announces the, the, uh, the, the, the future, the soon to be conception and birth of their son, uh, John, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth's son, John the Baptist. And then it's the archangel Gabriel who appears to Mary at Nazareth. So clearly, uh, it, and I, I suspect that knowing something of the Christian scriptures that uh, Muhammad uses Gabriel or identifies it as Gabriel who uh, dictates to him the Quran. So uh, the, the angel Gabriel is uh, one of the chief messengers in the, in the scriptures and particularly in the New Testament. So they, they, they has a, part, a very big part in revelation and taking, revealing to uh, Zechariah, revealing to Mary God's plan for them. So they, they, he is an agent of, of revelation. Uh, 
we, we, we don't see angels as inspiring Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James, John, or the, the others who wrote the uh, New Testament. Rather, it's the Holy Spirit himself, God the Holy Spirit, breathing and inspiring, the word is to breathe into, to inspire uh, the truth and guide the writing, all the while not eliminating the human author. Okay? So there's, that, again, as I said, that synergy, that working together of the human author with the divine author, God himself. Is that all right? Oh, you're very welcome, Christopher. Thank you for asking. Anyone else? York? Good. Good morning. Good morning. What is your name? Teresa. Teresa. Hi, Teresa. I was going to ask a circle question last time. Oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> you asked a what? A simple a circle question? question. Oh, sir. Oh, the circle. Okay, well, here. See what you made me do? <laughs> and Sister Geraldine, too. She got me the pointer. <laughs> yeah. So, my, my question today is... Um, if the truth of Christ is at the center of this circle, the Catholic Church, Church is along there with it, does the Church believe that all people are called to be Catholic? And along with that, um, what does the Church believe is the ideal method to accomplish the Eucharist? That's called evangelization, uh, or we, we, the phrase today is more the new evangelization. We do believe, we, we believe that God's desire is that all his sons and daughters, uh, all humanity, come to know him in the best and fullest way possible. And we believe that is only in Jesus. And Jesus intended that we have the full means of truth and sanctification. So the, the teachings of our tradition and scripture, uh, the, te the, the means of the sacraments and our Catholic liturgy. So yeah, and, and if you listen to those prayers, you know, we, we, the, those prayers said that we would hope that uh, through our good lives, through our preaching the word, living the word, that we would draw all humanity to Christ. That's, that really, is, isn't that the commission Jesus gave the church right at the time of the ascension? He said, go forth, teach all nations, baptize them. Okay? So uh, that's our commission, and you as a, as a baptized person, all of us are sent into the world to draw others to Christ. That, that's our, our, our prayer, that's our hope that all humanity would come to see in Christ the fullness of what God wants for us and the means of eternal happiness. Now, how do we do that? Well, we don't do it by forming a military and conquering people and saying either, you know, um, believe what we believe or we'll put you to death or you can pay a tax. Um, what we do is, is try to witness it ourselves and convince others by our lives, by the lives that we live, that they might want to look into and embrace Christ. So that, that's the mission of the church, to evangelize, to spread the good news. Okay. So like, um, if you have, like, for example, um, a Lutheran friend who wanted to be a pastor, should you um, encourage her or should you um, do, um, kind of try to evangelize her toward the Catholic Church. Well, uh, we wouldn't be evangelizing someone who's already a Christian. That, that, uh, there's evangelization, although the new evangelization is, is addressed to those of us who are already Christians, Christians but who are lukewarm you know, or are neutral. Um, and, and so the first thing is for us to get a greater zeal. When, when Pope John Paul, St. John Paul started to use that phrase, the new evangelization, it begins at home with us to come to a greater passion, a greater ardor or zeal for our Catholic faith. You know, you're not going to spread, if you're not excited about something, you're not going to want to tell others about it. It's something, it's just, you know, you're just neutral. So, so the very first thing is to let God the Holy Spirit inflame our faith to be more alive. And once that happens, then you do want to invite others to know the joy to know the truth that has, has made you more alive. So the, the new evangelization is focused on, on us to be more ardent, uh, more on fire about our faith. 
and then we'll be more willing to spread it. So if you've got a friend who, whose goal, whose vocation is to be a, a, a pastor in another Christian church, um, I, I would say you, you want to support that. That's her, that is her tradition, uh, her family. Uh, she's baptized. She's in Christ. She's very close in these, these uh, levels of uh, belonging to Christ and the church. Uh, if by your Catholic faith and faithfully living it, she begins to ask you questions, then maybe God's grace is at work in her to be considering what is it about you that drives you, that makes you different, that gives you the moral character that you have, that gives you the joy that you exhibit. Uh, and that's an opening then to say, well, it's my Catholic faith. It's, it's what I believe in the Catholic Church. And that may uh, draw her, him, uh, the person, to look into our faith. Lancaster Catholic, good morning. Good morning, Bishop. Thank you uh, for talking with us once again. My, uh, my question concerned, you were talking, you said the church verbally condemned the, the horrible actions going on in the Middle East, and with America militarily involved in the Middle East, I was just wondering if they considered it a just war, uh, in line with St. Augustine's um, just war theory. And although I know um, no one likes to use violence to stop other violence. I was just wondering if the, the church thought that was okay. Well, I think you know, the, the church, I, I haven't seen Pope Francis use that. He, he, he certainly wants to see a universal condemnation of what's going on. And then uh, at this point, it, it, it seems that since they have taken on such, you know, Nigeria, for instance, where Boko Haram is, the, Nigeria is the most populous African nation and one of the most affluent. And their, their military has been perhaps one of the best in, in, uh, in Africa as well. And, and they, they have uh, disheartened uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the military of, of Nigeria. So, so they've got a very strong military force. And I, I, I don't know how we respond or contain these atrocities without the use of force. Uh, so I, I think we could probably apply the, 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 the just war theory in saying that it, it, there's, there's not much chance of, of um, negotiation. There's not much chance of sitting down at a table and saying, let's, let's talk these out through, through diplomacy. Um, it, it seems that the only way to contain uh, and, and eliminate this threat to so many millions of people uh, is, is through a proportionate use of force. So um, and now, uh, the, the, we would always encourage every other means to be exhausted before we went to the use of force. But um, I, I think right now the, the, what the Pope is trying to do is to get all world leaders and particularly uh, uh, Muslim leaders to uh, condemn uh, very clearly and forcefully the actions of ISIS and Boko Haram and other Islamic uh, radicals. Okay, well, thank you, Bishop. Right. You're welcome. You see, one of the things about this theocracy is the intolerance of other religions. If, I, I was talking uh, some time ago to a, a bishop in Saudi Arabia. We can't own property. The Catholics, can, we can't have public uh, liturgy, that it has to be held in the basement of private homes or on some of the oil refinery properties or on military bases. But you can't simply operate a Catholic church. And our, our uh, Eastern Christians, uh, the, the Coptic church, the uh, Syrian uh, churches are suffering greatly. You, you hear the outcries of those bishops. Uh, please, world leaders, do something. Our people are just being eliminated. The, those who are not being executed are fleeing. Uh, those areas because it's impossible to live under the threat, uh, the, the daily threat of losing your life. Um, that, that if you read the story about those 21 Coptic Christians who were beheaded, uh, the throats slit, um, each one of them, uh, it, it, the, the video apparently you could read their lips and uh, in Coptic they were saying things like, Jesus Christ is Lord. 
right before the moment they were. Uh, so I mean, they they truly were martyrs, and they were they were killed because they were Christians. There's a total intolerance among these radicals for any other religion, and that that's the problem of a of a radical theocracy. Do we have anyone else? Anyone, uh, uh, any of the other schools or any other question you'd like to ask? No? Well, we're just about at that time anyway, right, right sister? Sure. All right. All right, well, thank you very much for your attention. I, I hope this was somewhat helpful. Some other things you can continue to think about from today, and I look forward to next Wednesday where we'll be talking about faith and reason, um, Genesis and science and things like that. So. Have a great rest of the day, and uh, God bless you. Thanks for being together this morning.